Good morning, friends. This morning, I'll be uh, touching on the weighty and significant role of mental health in our lives, both personal and corporate. And I want to take very good care of this topic, and I want to take very good care of those who find themselves more acutely aware of this realm of health. And so as we go to God's word and really as we avail ourselves to God's self, would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the considerations of each of our hearts please you. O Christ, the author of life, of resurrection, and the wholeness of all things to come. Amen. We are moving through a a series on listening. You might be tired of hearing about listening. Here in this series on listening, we are discovering or seeking to discover God's gracious invitation to listen and also celebrating God's intent to listen to us. And we're continuing with the book of 1 Corinthians. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to very newbie Christians in Corinth. Then they are in the throes of a growing Christian community. They don't know what's happening to themselves, really. And so as we look at this letter, I want us to consider this question that we are considering as we look at 1 Corinthians. What happens When we listen as a church, what happens when we listen as a church? We're going to jump right in. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, it's in the New Testament, Um, one of the earlier letters of Paul that we have organized here in the Bible. Uh, I do encourage you to take your Bible out because sometimes it's helpful to like look at real words on a real piece of paper. Uh, And we are going to read this together if you don't have a Bible or don't want to use the one in the pew in front of you, it's on the screens. Uh, Because Jesus loves you like that and we do too. We are uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we will read verses 6 through 16. Paul says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand uh, what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. God's word for God's people. But we have the mind of Christ. We, we have the mind of Christ. If I may be so bold, I wonder if the Christian church has developed some kind of psychosis. Psychosis is defined as a disorder in which thought and emotion are so impaired that 
contact is lost with external reality. In this bold wondering, uh, 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 the external reality is Christ. In this bold wondering, we as the Christian community are the body, a collection of people that are bound together by a common belief. This being has ways of, of thinking and, and emoting that are very specific to itself, us as a, a Christian community, if we are a, a body. I want you to think now of, of other ways, other examples that a collective being has a special and specific way of thinking or being. Perhaps you can think of other uh, religious groups. Last week or two weeks ago, we, talk about, we talked about uh, sports fans. You know, they have certain ways of being in the world that look a little crazy. I come from a family of cheeseheads. That's nuts, okay? Maybe our political affiliations connect us with a sort of being that looks very special and specific to itself. Maybe you are very committed to your alma mater, and that makes you look a little silly in certain situations. Can you think of other examples? Would you mind giving them to me, to, to each other, to us? Neighborhoods. Neighborhoods. Say it again. Pets. Pets. Like if you, oh, if you're like a cat lady, that's a good one. <laughs> we could go down a... A cat, not a rabbit trail, a cat trail on that one. Uh, any others? Clubs. Clubs. One more. Say it again. National origins or your heritage. That's a good one, Ellen. Thank you. Each of these groups has a way of functioning and being in the world that embody its distinctives. Cat ladies. Okay. Those who find themselves belonging to that group, they begin to adopt and then adapt and then acquire ways of thinking and emoting that match the group that they belong to, okay? The same thing is true for those in Christian communities. We have ways uh, that we have both adopted and adapted and acquired uh, thoughts and emotions that match the group that we are a part of. What I've wondered... Now, based on, on Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians 2, is that if it's possible to be a Christian community but not have the mind of Christ, is it possible to be a Christian body, a Christian body even, but not have the mind of Christ? Here, I think, may be the root of our psychosis. We have seen in recent years uh, through national events and sh even shifts within the, the big C church itself how easy it is to be a Christian body without the mind of Christ. This Christian body finds itself without contact with Christ, allowing its thoughts and its emotions to be ruled by a different power. And to be very honest, there, there are times when each of us have bought into the story that, uh, of being ruled by a different power as well. Sometimes that feels good. Sometimes we, as individuals, are the power. And when we have bought into this story, uh, we find ourselves stuck. I, I, I even wonder if we've bought into the story that a strong mission or the vision for the church is all we need to be effective disciples of Jesus. And because we've bought into the story that a strong mission or vision for the church is what we need to be effective, we've relied on, on personalities and performance to supercharge our mission in the world. We've expected that one person could call all the shots and that if you didn't follow along or you didn't get in, in line, you were just left out of the community or you might even be left out of the call to participate in the mission of the church. This may be how the world functions, but this is, is not 
how the body of Christ with the mind of Christ is to function. Paul instructs the Corinthians to invest, invest in the mystery that is the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is different than a Christian community. A body of Christ is different than a Christian community because the body of Christ has the mind of Christ. And though he drops his main thesis at the very end of our section, Like, Paul, wouldn't you say that at the beginning so that we could understand better? Even though he drops it there, he's he's leading us to this thesis the whole time. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Paul says no human mind will conceive of it. None of the rulers of this age will understand it. It is not received by the things of this world. It may actually look like pure silliness. We might even look crazy. And human judgments are not going to cut it when we are the body of Christ led by the mind of Christ. Craziness. Pastor Paul highlighted last week that, uh, that the ways we belong together and function and live together as the body of Christ can look ridiculous. Even just that we would come into a room and like, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Sometimes that looks silly. That we could then also sit next to someone and converse with someone that we disagree with? We don't see that very often. That we could come together and and make decisions together through a discernment process that no one could ever consider on their own? That sounds like craziness. That communing with the Spirit of God would be the source of our life and mission? That sounds woo-woo. Paul is preparing. In his letter, he's preparing to define what the body of Christ actually is and what the body of Christ actually does. Later in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, in chapter 12, we're going to get to that next week. But before that, he must be clear that a body without a mind, is just flesh. And a mind without a body is just thoughts. And the body of Christ is given the mind of Christ. And that without the mind of Christ, the body of Christ is actually dead. You see, in medical terms, a a person is pronounced dead when their brain, when their mind ceases to function. If a person's heart continues to beat by natural or or artificial means, if the lungs continue to breathe, but they have no brain function, they are declared dead, brain dead. Their body may be functioning, but their brain, their mind is not. So it is with the church. Our body may be functioning, making decisions, pulling off programs, engaging with our neighbor. But if the mind of Christ has been disconnected, if the body no longer has the mind, then the body is dead. And if we pretend, if we pretend that the mind is not gone, everyone's fine, everything's functioning as it should, then we're actually in a state of psychosis, the mind cut off from reality. Recently, scientists and biologists have made strides in their understanding of the human mind and body connection. Their research overwhelmingly suggests that our brains and our bodies biofeed one another. And it's not just that the brain tells the body what to do, but actually that our body can also tell the brain what to do. Our physical, mental, emotional functions are very deeply and intricately connected. They cannot be divided. I do want to say that studying the ways our bodies function is one way, I think, of understanding our createdness and our creator. And I'm not looking uh, to make science our God or, or make science textbooks our scripture, but I would rather like us to consider that any new discovery in science 
tells us a lot about our creator, makes us consider our creator differently, and it makes us consider our function as God's created in a new way. This uh, mind-body connection is the link between our emotional and mental health, which is our, our thoughts, our attitudes, and our behaviors, and our physical health. So the truth is, our biology impacts our mood. Interesting. Our emotions impact how we feel and function physically. For example, have you ever experienced your stomach tighten up when you feel anxious? Yes? You've experienced a mind-body connection. Or have you ever had that experience where your chest swells when you're, when you're surprised? Like, <gasps> you know, it just feels like, whoa, that's a lot. That's a mind-body connection. Have you ever had joy leak out of your eyes through tears? It's a mind-body connection. Why don't you look on the screen here? This is what researchers um, say that our feelings look like within our body. It might be hard to see this real far away, and I'm not wearing my glasses, those of you who are, uh, good luck. Uh, but you can see that like anxiety um, looks a certain way. The, the red and yellow mean that the body is functioning at a higher state. Um, if it's like black, that means it's functioning at a neutral state. If it's blue, the body is functioning at a, at a lower rate, which means uh, your body is responding by slowing things down rather than revving things up. So you can see like anxiety, you feel it right, right here, which is why your stomach uh, tightens when you are anxious. I love where, how you experience love. Like it's like all within the core. So interesting. Sadness. Sadness you feel in your hands and your feet. A low function. Shame in the cheeks. Do you see that? Very interesting. Happiness goes from your head to your toe. Our bodies and our minds are connected. Our emotions, our, our, our thoughts, our attitudes display themselves in our bodies. And our bodies can also tell our brains and our minds to respond in certain ways. If you've ever been scared before, uh, someone, someone frightens you, your whole body goes into a response and it tells your brain, you got to do something about it. That's your fight, flight, freeze um, uh, response. If you've ever experienced deep grief, you know that your body doesn't function the way uh, that it usually does outside of grief. It's hard to wake up in the morning. It's hard to see uh, situations clearly. There's a, a brain fog. It's not just because you're sad. Your body is doing this with you, telling your brain it's time to take a rest. Our bodies have something to say to our mind, and our, our mind has things to say to our bodies. And this is helpful awareness for us as individual beings, but it is very helpful awareness for us as the body of Christ. Even more so, it is good news for us. Not just helpful news, it is good news. Because it tells us that Christ is aware of how we are. Not just us as individuals, but how we are. If there is anxiety in the body of Christ, Christ responds. If there is joy in the body, Christ responds. If there is a need in the body, Christ responds to the need. This is the beauty and the benefit of being given over to Christ and being in Christ's body. A Christian community without the mind of Christ looks so different than the body of Christ with the mind of Christ. A Christian community without the mind of Christ allows its feelings and thoughts and emotions to be dead-ended. All of those things have nowhere to go if it can't feed back to the mind. These feelings and thoughts and emotions, they'll scream loudly. And without the mystery of God's response to meet them, they just scream. 
They then, those feelings, thoughts, and emotions become the source of all decisions. If there is anxiety, a body without the mind of Christ just responds with a decision. If there's joy, we respond with a decision. If there is fear, we just make a decision based on the fear to quiet the fear. And while there are certainly, uh, uh, there must be adjustments so that the body of Christ can experience the variety of circumstances that we find ourselves in, because this is what a body does, we do so, we make these adjustments with the mind of Christ, not the mind of humanity. And this is what it means to have one mind. It is not that we think all the same. I pray we don't. It is not that we have the same opinion about everything. I really hope we don't. It's actually that when we are Christ's body, which Jesus has called us, we are pursuing, to, pursuing and responding to the mind of Christ. But too often we have allowed the difference of opinion to divide us. We've allowed different ways of thinking to allow the body to be divided. And when we divide the body, we divide the body from the mind of Christ as well. And so how do we support this mind, body, and Christ connection? If we are the body of Christ and we are to pursue the mind of Christ, how do we do this? Scientists have actually suggested there are two things, just two things that support a human mind-body connection. And those two things are, um, the first is silence and solitude, and the second is community. I think that's so interesting. If you as an individual find yourself unaware of your emotions and your thoughts or unaware of how your emotions and thoughts are affecting your body, scientists say send, spending 20 minutes a day attending to your body in silence and breathing can drastically impact your mental health and your mind-body connection. 20 minutes a day breathing quietly. This is amazing. The other thing that scientists say is that regularly spending time in community drastically impacts your mental health and your mind-body connection. Being with other people, you don't have to have, you don't even have to agree with them. Just being with other people changes the way your mind and your body connect. Part of a scientific study I read suggested that cancer patients who join a community support group have better outcomes than a person who does not have a community support group. Further, another study built off of that study suggested that a cancer patient who is connected to a church community has a better outcome than a person who just has a community support group. This is some very profound science right here. But it's not only science, it's not. It's also part of the Christian life. Very often, Jesus invited his disciples to draw away to a quiet place. It's as though Jesus knew what the body needed. And then the very nature of Jesus' ministry was in community with people. And not just crowds, but community at the table. So if solitude and community, which seem like opposite ends of the spectrum, support an individual's body-mind connection, I would like to assume that the gifts of solitude and support of community encourage the body of Christ, mind of Christ connection. 